The existentialists claim that the reason that people are psychopathological is because the conditions of existence are so tragic that it's inevitable that people become psychopathological Right, and that's, okay, so what's the argument? Well, people are self-conscious, so that's a big problem So, and because we're self-conscious we know that we're going to die, we're aware of our temporal limitations so that's a real catastrophe, because no other animal has that problem Like elephants look like they've got some kind of a dim apprehension of it, but they're not articulate So they can't really get to the final stage of, you know, assessing their existence in relationship to its, its finitude And of course everyone knows that they're prone to illness of all sorts, and aging And that, you know, so is everyone else they know And that you can be damaged Incomprehensibly by untruth and by falsehood and by, by betrayal You know, and, then, and also that there's 150 things wrong with you That you're acutely aware of at almost all times So you, you fall short of perfection along pretty much any axis of comparison that you wish to generate And so the existential point of view on that is that all of that's enough to make the default condition of human beings Psychopathological it's like the weight of existence itself is sufficient to make normal pathological And, and it's, a very powerful, it's a very powerful argument, because one of the things you might ask and It's certainly something I've asked when I've dealt with people who have agoraphobia, for example Who are afraid to go out You know, they're afraid to go out because they might have a heart attack And then that they'll be too far away from the hospital and then they'll die while well, they make fools of themselves That's basically the agoraphobic sphere, so it's biological mortality plus social exposure, right? It's bad enough to die, but if you die in public while everyone's looking at you, then, you know, you get the worst of both worlds And it is, to me, it's not such a mystery that people are agoraphobic It's a mystery that other people aren't You know, and, and from the existential point of view, the mystery starts to become the, the ubiquity of normality, given the intolerable conditions of existence it's a much more powerful viewpoint, and I think it's correct too, because there's no reason to assume that the default condition of mankind is like calm, rational acceptance of fate. It's like you have to have very, very specific conditions that you're in before you're calm and and and, and you know feeling comfortable and sort of hopeful about the future. It's like that's a rare state to achieve. We can assume that's normal. At least to some degree in our society, because it's unbelievably technologically sophisticated and We're not hungry that often, we're not cold that often, or, you know, or even sick that often But to think of that as the norm, it's like, no, no definitely not That's, It's a miracle that it's ever like that Now the other claim the existentialists make, fundamentally, is something like this is like, well, if the fundamental conditions of existence are tragic at, at minimum, because there's worse, there's evil too, which is different than tragedy Because evil is sort of like unnecessary tragedy You know, because there's earthquakes, say, and you know, who are you going to blame about that? But then you're, there's you going to school and you know, there's four people who've got it out for you And all they do is pound you flat every time you, you enter the building or make fun of you and you know, try to torture you to death That's, that's not tragedy, that's, it's not, it's not your accidental subjugation to fate, it's some Horror show perpetrated on you by people whose only goal is to make sure that there's more suffering in the world rather than less So you also have to put up with that But we'll leave that aside for the time being You're stuck in your pathology because the conditions of existence are intolerable to a self-conscious being We'll say that So then you might ask, well what could you do about that? Well here's one potential answer And that answer is See what happens if you stop doing Things you know to be inadequate and wrong So the hypothesis is every time you engage in an activity like that You weaken yourself You put yourself down first, you remove your own self-confidence But you also fail to take the opportunity to expand your domain of competence What would life be like if you didn't do that? And the existential claim is it's, 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 a, it's a weak claim in some ways The claim is, well, it's, there's two One is, if you don't do that, if, if you don't try to fix the things that you could fix Things will go from bad to worse for your life, and that will spread out, and it will take everyone else's life along with it 
So, that, so that's on the negative end. So you don't do it because of the negative end. But then there's a positive claim too, which is maybe if you stopped bullying yourself, the tragic conditions of existence would become bearable because you would be strong enough to tolerate them. And, and it, it's, it, it's analogous to Jung's idea of progression towards the self. It's, because Jung has a very strong existential theme underlying his work, derived mostly from Nietzsche. But it's, it's the most optimistic, it's the only optimistic hypothesis I've ever seen in psychology. Truly optimistic hypothesis. Because there's other hypotheses like the positive illusion hypothesis, which is basically life is so tragic that you have to tell yourself, you know, happy falsehoods just so you don't go insane, and that's what normal people do, which I think is an absolutely appalling philosophy. It's, it's, it's the ultimate in cynicism, that. But still, that, you know, there's a huge literature on the supposed utility of positive illusions. And then there's also the associated sort of terror management hypothesis, which is that the purpose of your belief systems is to protect you from the anxiety of death, which is sort of a variant of the Freudian idea that religion was a childish delusion designed to protect people from terror of their own mortality. It's a very powerful cr critique of, re of religion, although it's one that I happen to think is wrong. I mean, one of the problems with Freud's formulation is that it fails to deal with you know, concepts like the underworld and hell. I mean, if, if you're going to just whip up a belief system to protect yourself against the fear of death, why in the world would you envision something like an eternity of suffering worse than death if you ever step out of line? It's very hard to understand how that's a defense mechanism. Now, a cynic would say, well, the only reason that, say, Christians invented hell, even though they didn't, it's, it's a very old idea, is so that they had somewhere convenient to put people who didn't agree with them. But you have to be unbelievably cynical to assume that that's the only reason. And I, I don't think there's any historical support for the idea that that's the only reason. Now, I'm going to tell you some, I'm going to tell you some stories or, so, that some of the most famous existentialists in history told. They're, they're ideas and, and quotations. And, and I, the existentialists that I've read are often the most powerful of, of writers. So Dostoevsky is an existentialist, and Solzhenitsyn is an existentialist, and so is Viktor Frankl, who survived the concentration camps, and Kierkegaard. Very weird collection of people. I mean, their, their fundamental belief systems were often very much at odds with one another. Some of them are atheists, and some of them are Orthodox Christians, especially, uh, you know, because a lot of the literary existentialists were Russian. So you can come at existentialism from a variety of origin points. But what they have in common is, is what I kind of outlined. Is that the first idea is that essential preconditions of life are sufficiently tragic to render the normative state of humanity pathological. And, and health something as something, and health and wholeness as something very difficult to, to uh, uh, aspire to or accomplish. And that, and that the road to that health is the reduction of deceit. And so that's a thing that's also very interesting about the existentialists, because they make a very straightforward moral claim, which is that lies make people sick. And I'll, I'll tell you, in my experience as a psychotherapist, I mean, you know, I can tell you some of the things that make people sick. A lot of them have nothing to do with the psyche. The things that make people sick are, well, they get unemployed. It's like unemployment just lays people out, especially if they're conscientious. They just devour themselves. And it's so stressful, right? Because if you're unemployed, well, your, your finances become shaky almost right away. Plus, you don't have any routine. Plus, you're not involved in anything meaningful in relationship to society. You know, and then you start to eat yourself up with doubts and, and, and uh, you know, self-criticism, especially if you're a conscientious person, or especially if you're a conscientious person who's high in negative emotions, like unemployment will just flatten you. And then the death or illness of yourself or a close relative, that's really hard on people. And, uh, there, and there are situations at work that are difficult, so people are bullied, maybe they have a terrible supervisor or they're, or they're in, in a pathological social structure so that you know, they're basically being bullied and oppressed with every step they take, or they're in a very horrendous relationship, but, but then things start to turn a bit. So, okay, so 
You can lose your job and you can be ill or dying and, and so can people around you and that will lay you low a lot of the time and no wonder, right? It's, it's logical and when, when people come to me with those sorts of problems the first thing I often note is they're not psychological I tell the people that that's not a psychological problem you're unemployed that's an actual problem and it's really useful to distinguish those, right? So, so for example, and this is something that psychiatric diagnosis does very, very badly if someone comes to me and, and they're depressed, so they're not sleeping properly, they feel terrible in the morning you know, they, they, they don't have a lot of energy, they're having a hard time experiencing any positive emotion it's difficult for them to move, um, and they have a lot of negative thoughts about the past and the present and the future I do an analysis of their life first to say, well, you know, do you have a job that's, you know, alright that, that, you know, that, that at least isn't horrifying you know, is it okay for you to go to work in the morning? Do you have an intimate relationship that's basically functional? Do you, do you have some friends? You know, um, are your relationships with your family members okay? Are you reasonably healthy apart, apart from the depression? And do you have useful and interesting things to do that aren't related to your career? And if the person says yes to all of those and they're still feeling terrible, then I think, okay, this person is depressed, right? Because they don't have a problem, they're just depressed. And in my experience, those are the people who respond quite well to antidepressants You know, because their nervous system isn't calibrating its analysis of their situation to the reality of the situation It's as if their lower status, according to their status comparator, which is a very primordial thing, since even lobsters have it so Their status comparator isn't paying attention to their actual status And maybe that's because they're, you know, temperamentally high in negative emotion, or maybe it's because they had been traumatized earlier in their life and so they're much more sensitive to any signs of failure it's, easy, it's easier to knock them down but then you have the other people who are well, they don't have a job and they, ha they never have, and maybe they're 30 or 35 no real stable employment history no real educational history, it's pretty patchy one or more illnesses and then family members who are just out for their absolute destruction, like families can be unbelievably pathological so they're enmeshed in a familial situation where for one reason or another as soon as they get up off the ground a little bit someone knocks them back down and so, and then maybe they have a drug or alcohol problem to go along with that or they have a relationship with someone who has a drug and alcohol problem or a mental illness and sometimes you see people who have like all five of those things going on at the same time it's like that's not precisely mental illness now a lot of that's associated with deceit you know, they're entangled in relationships and, and in relationships with themselves that are pathologically untrue so I've seen people, for example, who I've seen people who are in families where probably nothing they were ever told was true like it was never just true, it was always twisted and bent in some way by whoever was talking to them for the purposes of that person power or domination or, or positive illusion or, or delusion or something like it, all the communication within the family was motivated and so there, it, it's so awful to grow up in an environment like that because you can't get a grip on what's real and then, you know, it can get worse than that in that the person will tell you that they love you and they'll act all sweet but every time you do anything that's even vaguely productive and useful they'll just criticize you to death and all the while telling you that they love you it's really horrible and that's all tangled up with deception and lies and, and it's a weird thing because if you look at the Freudian hypotheses you'll notice that Freud attributed an awful lot of psychopathology to repression right? but I think the distinction between repression and self-deception or deceit is very permeable it's like, what's the difference between repressing something and lying to yourself about it? well, Freud would say often that repression occurs unconsciously but I really wonder about that, I think that what happens is that something happened or you did something that you don't like and it's bothering you and you could think it through but you just decide not to, you just don't think it through so it's left vague and uncertain and you know, it's fairly emotionally salient but you just refuse to think it through and you practice doing that until you've built up a habit 
of not thinking that through and then you forget that you've built up the habit and then it's like it's being repressed unconsciously but I think that you know or at least you knew when you first did it and so, you know, when you meet people who are acting in a twisted and peculiar way and you ask yourself uh, they're very manipulative, say, you ask yourself well, do they know what they're doing? the answer to that could be, well, no but another answer could be yeah, but they knew once they knew when they made the decision to start acting like that but after they did it a hundred times or so and made it into an automatic routine well then they forgot its origin and now it runs autonomously and so now they don't know but they did know and so, you know, this is the sort of point and this is the real point of the existentialists where clinical psychology and, and the claims of morality start to become very tightly aligned and it's something that the psychiatric and psychological industries, so to speak, don't really tackle head-on my experience has been that in these situations, for example, where the person has five terrible things going on in their life that there's just deception twisted in and strewn in all of that people are betraying each other, and there's no fidelity in the relationships there's no clear and genuine communication everything's manipulation, no one admits to what they're really up to you know, there's a lot of false and saccharine love which has absolutely nothing to do with love, it's all for appearance you know, and, and you cannot be healthy in a situation like that I don't think, in my experience you know, apart from terrible luck because, you know, you can get cancer, diabetes, or any number of awful things in my experience, apart from the tragedies of life there is nothing that hurts people more than deception lies do people in and that's an existentialist claim the claim is, first, while life is basically unbearable, that's an existential claim and then there's, there's the hope that with sufficient caution and attention and clarity of, of thought and speech, you can, man, you can master it you can, you can master it to the point where you could even accept the fact that it's tragic but if you multiply its tragedy with the use of deceit it's like, forget it because, you know, it's one thing to be hurt you know, maybe you break your leg that's one thing it's another thing to be attacked by two or three people who break your leg and do everything they can to demean you at the same time it's like, lots of people break their leg and they're not traumatized it's very few people who can go through the latter experience without being, you know, seriously and permanently damaged 